thank you so much for coming and uh, uh, i would like to uh, today i would like to welcome uh, matthias hanson uh, phd in mathematics um and thank you uh, matthias for uh, for accepting our invitation and Matthias uh, graduated from a PhD program uh, in mathematics at Lund University just a few years ago in 2013. And his thesis was entitled uh, Statistical Segmentation and Registration of Medical Ultrasound Data. Um, and then he um, also completed a postdoc project at the University of Copenhagen. Uh, and then he had uh, experience working as a software uh, as a scientific programmer, I'm sorry. Uh, and today uh, we will uh, talk with Matthias about, yeah, about his uh, his way up to this point and what his plans are and what are the conclusions from from his experience on the job market as a PhD. So thank you again, Matthias, for accepting the invitation. And I would like to uh, hear your story, um, uh, hear your story from your perspective. Uh, well, thank you. Well. I Maybe I should just describe myself a little bit first. Uh, I mean, as you said, I, I, my background is in mathematics, but it's sort of been a, a, a journey towards uh, data science, I would say. So more and more uh, coding as, as you go. I mean, it's, of course, my, my work is more theoretical uh, in the beginning uh, and as a postdoc, but then it's now turning more into sort of uh, data science applications and, and uh, working with the latest tools uh, uh, like AWS, Azure, and uh, Google Cloud Platform. Um, so I, I think for me, it's been that's been a journey through like becoming a scientific programmer, and then I had worked uh, as, for a while, like a year, in, in, in at a data well, at a market, digital marketing company, which uh, I think up to that point, I think I, uh, I was pretty happy with working in, here in Netherlands, but I think this has really turned me off. To it, I think my experience at this this company, and I, it's uh, I think also it's, it's mm, I think it's it's interesting to think about this when you when you when you talk about uh, the difference between academia and industry, uh, there can be quite a big difference. It doesn't have to be necessarily, but I think, and I know for, for some people it's not, but I think also this kind of uh, it clashed too hard with me this this world of uh, marketing and uh, <laughs> uh, just. I just didn't fit in, I think. So, so in the end, that that that's what why I ended up leaving uh, that position uh, last year in uh, in October, which was uh, turns out a great a great timing because then, uh, as I was looking for jobs, <laughs> Corona hit. So, uh, yeah. So now I'm basically I'm, I'm I've started my own company, and uh, but what what I do now basically is I I, I I study. So that's that's what I do. I, I deepen my knowledge in, in different tools. And stuff like that, um, like I previously mentioned. I don't know if that uh, that sort of answers anybody's question. Uh, but I think that's that the brief, the brief, the brief journey. I mean, I, I, of course, there's more details. Um, okay, thank you very much. Uh, actually, one comment, um, guys. You can ask questions anytime in the chat. Does uh, indeed uh, uh, really um, a very short version of of your story. So I of course have more questions about it. Uh, so, um, yeah, so you said that uh, what you were doing in your PhD was very theoretical. Uh, and so uh, did you already like learned uh, something about programming during your PhD or you had to learn it later? I think so. Uh, I think this is an experience that um, many people, especially older people like me, have. Uh, I think it's less so now, but most people, uh, their experience in mathematics, it's, it's MATLAB. Uh, I think as I was like coming out of my PhD, it was more sort of the new students start work with Python. Um, I think, and I know, and and to be fair, also I know this from from my wife that the, the, the who works in Eindhoven, who teaches there, <clears throat> that uh, there is still a migration going on from MATLAB to Python. So, but I think it's it's headed that way. And for me, it's for me this sort of migration has been done on my own. So it's. Uh, it's not been really. I've been. I'm taking courses, of course, but it's it's not something that was included in my in my study program or anything. I think that was required. So it's. I do think that the, nowadays your your potential to have a head start with the, uh, the the latest tools it's much greater, and also because of just look at the availability of things is just so much greater than it was. I mean, it's moved so fast. Like 
10 years ago, it, it's, it's hard to imagine where we're sitting now with, uh, with all these cloud platforms, which offer uh, huge scalability. And uh, of course, we, we, we still have this issue that, uh, of course, I, I, I've been always been working with medical data and that uh, I'm sure if anybody's worked with medical data, you know the problem of, uh, uh, well, basically GDPR, what, uh, all these data protection and directives, which make it difficult to use these kind of platforms sometimes. But if you're working with public data, I think, which I, I strongly endorse, <laughs> don't work with, uh, with the medical data that is, that is uh, protected in some way. It will just hamper you. Um, so so I, I think basically you have, have all these tools now that, that you, and you can also educate yourself really quickly, things that you couldn't do 10 years ago. So, so for me, it's, it's been sort of a, a journey on my own. I think it it's, was harder than, than it would have been now. I think now it's, it's great. You, there's so, it's so easy to learn how to code. And that's actually very interesting because uh, last week we had a, um, a meeting with Andre Marcus Smith who also actually educated himself through, uh, through online courses and he uh, requalified from experimental neuroscientist to computational neuroscientist and and got the job in a good uh, company doing now is doing only only programming job and programming neural networks and he uh, indeed in a few months only he himself um, yeah requalified requ only using the knowledge uh, from internet so that's uh, that's uh, and I didn't even know that this is such a uh, popular trend. So I knew that this is possible, but I thought that uh, it's like a mar marginal effect that there is some little percentage of PhDs that actually uh, make use of that opportunity. But in fact, uh, judging from what you say and that you're already the second person this month that actually reports to be a success, successful, have a su successful transi transition after um, self-education then I can uh, I can tell that probably it's actually uh, not as rare. So that's a good news because every um, I think every trend that gives uh, people personal freedom is a good trend. And in this case, there is a democratization of knowledge and there is a lot of uh, opportunity and choice. Um, so I think uh, yeah, it's definitely good for uh, for the society. So uh, great to hear. Um, okay, so uh, could you also tell us a little bit more about the company that you um, worked for and the, the, um, the you know, not necessarily um, precisely what, what it's called, and but but maybe uh, what type of work it does? Oh, yeah, yeah of course. Uh, so uh, basically it was a digital marketing company. Uh, and what, what that means basically is you, uh, you use, I mean, very broadly, you, you you mine data out of websites uh, or and, and commerce traffic using tools like Google Analytics. It's very common. And then uh, what I did is I, I built uh, predictive uh, machine learning models on that to uh, well to uh, 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 well to to for to sort of predict the customer behavior basically. And there's something called attribution models. Also, if you heard about that, I worked with that. Uh, so so Mark and Brandon Fields. Um, I, I made also I, I, at that company. I also I, I was sort of leased out as a scientist to a, an energy company a startup where I built a model for how to, to uh, compute the the energy needs of a house houses how different house house types in the Netherlands. Um, so that that turned out to be an application that they they were using. So it was a bit varied, but I would say mostly it's about um, working in. I was. Basically, a data scientist that was assigned to in data scientist or mathematician assigned to a project, and then uh, that project could be anywhere from like two months to a year. So, yeah. Uh, so, in a, in a way, you are doing a consultancy job. Uh, like oh yeah, 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 totally. Yes. Okay. Yeah, actually, I, I recognize this model now, uh, given also speakers we had before. I didn't even know that you were a consultant. I thought you were a software developer within the company, so that's a, a surprise. But okay, so um, can you tell us a little bit about um, your decision to leave that place? Like, could you tell us a little bit? Yeah, about yeah, yeah. yeah. For, 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 like I said, I think it's, it has to do with um, for me sort of the clash between uh, so. I, the sort of the management culture there was. Uh, 
that project managers have had very little idea about what actually was happening in the project. That was my feeling, at least the project I worked on. Uh, and then that sort of translated when the, 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 the client started pushing, then they transferred that to us uh, in very uh, not useful ways. And to the point that they actually made me very angry several times. So because they were they were quite disrespectful, and also after you have to remember also I am quite a lot older than these people, and I will not be spoken to by like this by people who I find to be quite uneducated. And um, and then I find I was like okay, so this is like it's giving me blood pressure problems. I'm not going to do this anymore. <laughs> so that that is the short of it. So. For okay. me, it's like, and I, and I think honestly, I think it's it's all for the better. It's, uh, I mean, it's not great for uh, my economy or anything like that. I mean, it's it's uh, not good at all, especially now that we have Corona happening. It it certainly is prolonging my unemployment period quite a bit. <laughs> so, it is very hard to find a job out there right now. Just to be <laughs> just to be clear, but uh, I, I think I, I think in the end, it's um, it's I know what I. I it's but this is up to everybody, of course. I mean, you know what you can accept and what you cannot accept, and I think it's it's just that easy. And it wasn't the first time it had happened. It was it was a pattern that this has happened. So I could just see it continuing. So I was like, no, that's it. No. Yeah, actually, I think it's really important to also not only talk about success stories, uh, but also to um, to also talk about uh, the bottlenecks and uh, situations like this because. You know, it's also actually sometimes an issue here at this webinar that people who come over like and decide to do it and then uh, go public with their um, story and opinions are those uh, people who feel uh, safe uh, in a way that they are uh, they know they are happy enough in in their current job or with their like former employers so that they can safely talk about them and sometimes that um, creates a bias. So um, altogether, you know, you can <laughs> from Watching these episodes, you can uh, you can get an impression that uh, life outside academia is always uh, amazing and it's always uh, only success. And sooner or later, every every project works out, which is not true. And uh, it's also important to to share stories like this one that actually not necessarily the co cooperation is not necessarily. Um, satisfying to the to the to the PhD person and uh, actually one thing I wanted to say is also that um, yeah I, I very much respect what you said about uh, your own rules so I, I totally agree you have to have your own boundaries and uh, sometimes it's good before you actually go out to the job market after a PhD sometimes it's also good to sign first before you sign a contract with someone else first uh, sign a contract with yourself so actually delineate these boundaries and uh, decide what is acceptable for you and what type of behaviors you could accept and which of, which types of behaviors are uh, um, deal breakers for you. And just write it down and write a contract with yourself and then you feel much safer and much more self-confident once you actually step out to the real world. And I think in situations like this, it also helps you uh, make the right decisions. And I also think that yeah, people have this tendency to um, stick to dead end projects and dead end uh, bosses away uh, too often. So uh, it's good that you didn't. But I, I totally, I mean, so I have to be clear that uh, that I understand why people don't step away from a, a job. I mean, of course, it's income. So I mean, it's uh, this has to be something that you you. I mean, clearly, I think given what I know now, maybe I wouldn't have stepped off at that point. Because of Corona, but I, I didn't know. So, you know, so there's always a, there's always a risk, you know. So it's, uh, but yeah, I, I think I think this is I've done this several times in my in, in my in my academic like my academic career. I, I switched uh, my PhD advisor uh, like to the one third way through because uh, he was infuriating me. So uh, and that was also like it was very tough to do. So it's it was uh, so it, it was something that. I was led there by, I, of course, I didn't know the consequences when I did it. So it's if I had, I probably would not have done it. So, but I think also in the end, it 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 was better for me because it's I just can't go around and have all this resentment brewing in me daily. It just makes me ill. Like I cannot do it. 
So, but that that being said, I I, I I totally respect people who who I know people who work in this company who are very happy, who are very good people. So, it's in the end, this is my experience, and and this specific sort of situation I was in. Uh, so it's always like that. You always have to sort of you you shouldn't listen. You should listen to yourself. Not to, don't listen to me. You know? <laughs> don't don't listen. Don't listen to uh, people. Well, you should listen to people around you, of course. But I mean, at, in the end, it's something that you have to think about and sort of. Some people, some people are maybe less, you could say, maybe less rash than I am, which I totally respect. So it's probably better. In the <laughs> but I mean, for me, it's like it's it's nice not to be become infuriated on a daily basis. That's good. I think that's good for me. Right, and as far as I am concerned, it's also it was not a, a rapid decision for you, right? So no, no, it, it seemed like that. I think to to people who who uh, who are at the company, uh, but uh, there were so many microaggressions that had happened before then. I mean, I had told some people before that they should just back off, that they were being disrespectful and stuff like that. But they, they didn't listen; they just continued. So it's uh, well, and in the end, I was like, okay, this is not gonna. I can I cannot. I think mainly. I think it's just this this management culture, which it's. I don't think this company is alone is alone about this, and it's not something that they have created. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think it's like uh, for me, for me, it's just important that that if you're a manager managing a project, that that you have the skills needed to handle the project. I shouldn't be. I shouldn't have to explain to you uh, mathematical concepts. You should be educated. So I know this is a controversial. I mean, because project management has become its own science, you know, uh, science. So, as I say, but uh, I don't agree with this. I mean, I, I, I think you you cannot just be a project manager. You need to have uh, the skills also. And this will also help you a lot because people will respect you. So, but this is not how today's world works. So it's, uh, at mm -hmm. least in my, in, in my uh, assessment. So. I think there's uh, some variety here because uh, in some consultancy companies, managers are also specialists. And that's also true about many R&D departments in companies. And that's also what some people here at the webinar were also reporting, that their manager is actually a very good specialist. But it's uh, maybe right. not... Uh, I think that's a good, good thing. Good thing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so uh, probably the quality also offered by consultancy companies and their... You know, every company is like a little universe. Like the, uh, it's not that there is uh, one universal culture that every co company has. It's uh, once you enter a new door, you have to relearn from scratch how the rules uh, work in that place. And and I think the types of management also every company has like a different uh, spirit and uh, different types of different strategies for managing people. So indeed, like what you're saying sounds like something really suboptimal. Yeah, 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 and as I said, it, it, this is my experience. So I, I, I can say this that that for sure there are other people who have other experiences because I'm still friends with them. I meet with one of the guys I meet with like every week. So it's in his he's very happy there. So it's uh, it can be, but he works with different people also, and it's uh, yeah. So it's, it's it is. It, it's a complicated thing, you know. So it's. it's uh, Things are not so black and white in the end. So yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's also that people are like, are like chemicals; like they react differently with different people. And oh yeah, this this cannot be overemphasized. I think that this is this is totally the case. Uh, um, okay, so um, so do you think that this is um, this problem that you had experienced? Uh, is it a more general problem in consultancy companies here in the Netherlands, or do you think that? Uh, this is a specific problem with this particular place. Honestly, I mean, m my experience in consultancy companies is this company. So I would not, uh, it's a sample size one. So <laughs> I would not deign to, uh, I don't know, maybe, I don't know. I hope, I can seriously hope not. I mean, as you said also that the, that the, you had talked to people who had, were working in, in, uh, in these project groups where the, the manager was a specialist. I mean, that sounds good to me. Of course, that's not a it's, of course it's not a guarantee for anything in the end. I mean, it's it's the 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 sort of the chemistry of people working and also people being trying to be nice to each other. I think this, which is a rare thing these days. <laughs> so so it's I, I think probably if I'm going to guess, it's not only about consultancies. I mean, it's any workplace. So it's it. it 
I think it has to do in the end. I think it has to do with, with what kind of culture is promoted in the company. Um, that sort of that that, that will some because there are, there are people who can who can sort of stand up to that culture and build their own thing and just be nice and. But then, of course, if you have the sort of thing which is permeating from above, then my guess is that that will that will influence the people like mm -hmm. to not be so nice. And it's there's, it's not put a premium on that. Maybe you're just everything is just speed, speed, speed. Well, this I think is more about sort of a uh, criticism of capitalism in the end. <laughs> it's a larger thing. So, but mm -hmm. I mean that's another question. Right. And actually, I also agree that uh, yeah, no one could actually predict. Uh, no one, no one expected the Spanish Inquisition. You know, like no one could tell half a year ago what what we what we would experience now. So no, no, no. I mean, that... uh, there was only a very few people who took it seriously. You know, I mean, the I mean, you can always find signs, right? So, but it's uh, uh yeah, it's it's really easy to sort of be uh, sort of say, oh yeah, 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 I saw it coming. I mean, no. And also for data scientists around the Netherlands, it was uh, probably a sector in which like finding a job is the easiest. It was literally like people were just uh, recruiting you literally in the street uh, and just grabbing you from the street because there's such a demand and so many open positions and such a uh, such a um, uh, yeah so, such a low amount of people with good programming skills. Actually, yeah, it, used to, it used to be very. I think now now we're looking at. Uh, it's <laughs> a different market. Yeah, true. Yeah, yeah but actually, uh, the Netherlands is a country where what I also see, uh, even at the tech conferences, like I go to those meetups often, and and I can see that in a room full of people, like it's a hundred people, and it's supposed to be a tech meetup, right? So you would expect that uh, conversations will be very technical, and uh, and in a room uh, of hundred people, there is maybe three, four that can actually program, and all the rest is uh, business developers, visionaries, you know, people who want to sell you stuff. Like there's like people who want to uh, uh, make some money, like investors and just shilling, like uh, sh fishing for fishing for some uh, new projects. And it's like almost no one who in a text, in a tech meetup that that can, can actually program and actually understands the, uh, the bottom, you know, the projects to the bottom. And so it's really like we have like, I think very deep, um, deficiency of uh, technical people still so uh, yeah so i can imagine like that uh, those uh, like in a normal situation when we don't have a virus then that's a very highly demanded skill uh, but yeah we have really an unusual situation right now and it's I, unusual to everyone like for me also because like uh, you know like i created a little company last year that uh, the business model was based on events and like what do you do if uh, you have lockdown and you have no chance to organize events anymore and that's also how this uh, how this panel actually started because I had to come up with uh, very quickly come up with some solution how to uh, showcase what the company is doing and how to produce some new interesting content uh, without much investment and be able to broadcast it online so actually doing webinars is like one way of doing it and that was uh, I could set in this condition. So it's like uh, it kind of uh, also pushed me out of my comfort zone that to do something that I would normally not do. Uh, I don't see myself really doing this just because I felt like so. Like so, uh, now I I feel like uh, probably this is a habit that is going to stay because I really enjoy doing this. But uh, but I would never ever uh, come up to this idea if not uh, if not the crisis. So uh, so it's funny like how it can turn out in both ways actually it can also push you to do things and learn things that uh, you could other you you otherwise wouldn't uh, wouldn't learn. Yeah, indeed. Okay, so let's let's uh, let's talk about your uh, your uh, plans a little bit right now. And guys, like if you have any questions, you can uh, ask anytime. Like we are looking at the chat all the time, so uh, so please ask uh, whatever you feel like. I'm sure that Matthias will have some good answers for 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 these questions. Sure, um, okay. Yeah. So uh, so Matthias, so what do you do right now, and what is your plan? Because you mentioned the company, so what's the what's the big plan here? <laughs> yeah. Well, so the company is is not very active due to Corona. So basically, I don't, and there's no contracts to be had for for. It, it's a basically a, a data science uh, consulting company. So it's uh, but there's there's really nothing much happening in that. 
So in, in lieu of anything uh, like in the job market, I am uh, educating myself as, as, as we talked about, basically using the tools that are out there and uh, just um, strengthening my skills where I feel they should be strengthened. Like currently I'm working, I'm working on uh, learning more about containerization. So that, that's what I'm doing. Just uh, something that I've done a little bit before, but I, I want to, more, to be more solidly uh, informed about it. So, so stuff like that. I mean, it's it, it's like that, and uh, yeah, and uh, <laughs> and then sending applications, of course, to jobs. And it's uh, sometimes I also I, I've, I've been headhunted for one position, which frustratingly didn't turn out anywhere because they wanted me to move to Sweden. <laughs> so <laughs> suddenly. That, that was very strange, but um, yeah. So, so, so it's like um, it's just being being active, and, and um, uh, I mean, it, it, I think it's I would never have so much time. The upside of this is I would never have so much time to spend on just coding and uh, learning new things about setting up new environments and stuff like this. That that I would just, uh, just working. I mean, because that's. Then you're sort of always chasing a deadline, and it's it's very difficult to sort of take a, a systematic approach to anything, which I think is much easier now. But of course, I would prefer to be in um, to be employed. I mean, that's <laughs> that's the goal of all this. So it's uh, I think the the future is a, a uncertain, but the future is always uncertain. So yeah, that's true. On the other hand, like it won't be any worse, right? So like uh, it... oh, it can always get worse. <laughs> it can always get worse. Well, but, yeah, I'm <laughs> trying to come up with some positives here. <laughs> no, no, but I mean, I think we're looking at something. I, I am, I think, pretty positive about uh, what's going to come out of this, and I think it's going to be okay in the end. So it's, I just, I just uh, try to do my best for what the, the time I have uh, right currently. So it's, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it is challenging. I mean, I'm, I'm sure everybody has this experience now, like where you, you're suddenly thrust into not going out to work and uh, you sort of left at your desk at home and then okay what now so uh, that's that's sort of a new a new thing for most everybody now so it's uh, i think it, there's a period transition happening but i do think it's there are many like you said i think there are many things we have learned about this that and also i think also hopefully companies have learned that working on a distance is not such a bad thing in the end i mean there's a lot of benefits to it and the tools are getting better for it they're not perfect but I mean, stuff like this. I mean, I didn't know that there was such a thing as webinar geek. I'm sure there was a year ago, but I'd never heard of it. Actually, uh, I've never heard of it neither. I just needed to have some good tool for uh, launching webinars. And I learned that unlike Zoom, uh, webinar geek is a Dutch company. And I feel very patriotic about Dutch economy, especially even that I'm a part of it. So <laughs> I decided to use webinar geek instead of using Zoom. Uh, so that was my motivation, and uh, yeah, there are a few platforms like this indeed, I, and I also didn't know. It's like also that's what entrepreneurship is, you learn in the process. Like today I had to learn what is a Lighthouse uh, uh, plugin for uh, for Chrome because my, uh, my uh, company website is clogged and I have to figure out how to unclog it myself, and uh, I had to learn something new. It's like every every day like you have to... Uh, yeah, you have to you have to learn. So actually, my question for you would be: um, How do you see yourself um, in the long run? So do you see yourself more as an uh, entrepreneur and as an owner of a company, or do you see yourself as an employee again? Oh, that is tough to say. I think I think in the in 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 sort of the short run, I think the most likely thing or the best thing would be to find an, a, like a, a job again, I think. But certainly I think uh, in the long run, I do want to have my own business. I think it's that's that's something that I think is best suited for me. It just needs to be sort of the right time for it. I think now is not a good time. So <laughs> it's, it's about finding that time where you need to step out. I mean, I, I'm happy for it in a way that, I mean, it's not, not that it's difficult to, to, to sign up for to get a, the, um, a small business in, in the Netherlands it's very easy so but I mean you still have to go through some steps and, and do it and there was also some complications also with it being corona times which made it more difficult mm -hmm. but I, I think it's I'm happy about having learned about that and the tax things and stuff like this so I think it, there is a learning curve here which is nice so right so it's but I do think um, 
in the short term, certainly uh, finding an, uh, finding stable employment, whatever that means, uh, and uh, then later on just building the company, uh, and then. Yeah. Well, actually, one thing I learned about uh, setting companies is, not, is that yeah, it's not a big deal to set a company. It's actually much harder to work out a functional business model where you have a good stream of income and, uh, yeah. and uh, make people know about you and, and uh, generate any sales. And this is like 90% of the job and oh, for sure. maybe 10% yeah. is actually creating an actual product. And um, so also, if you don't have that... Um, natural uh, kind of affinity to hustle <laughs> like i think it's really something that entrepreneurs like should have because otherwise knowing how much percentage of your work is the actual hustle then uh, if you don't really enjoy the you know persuading people to stuff then it do, you will have hard time in the long run unless you can delegate someone to do it yeah this is not me so i think <laughs> i'm not i'm not hustling <laughs> <laughs> so maybe that's, that's a minus. I think your uh, your wife is a very good hustler. So. Oh yeah, yeah. So yeah, I could use my wife for this. <laughs> but she also has a real Twitter presence. <laughs> I, oh. I I have a Twitter account which I've never touched. So, but it's also being a we're different generations. I, I'm I'm quite much older than my wife, so <laughs> it's it's, it's the, it, the younger people I know. I think uh, they do the Twitter. Yeah, actually, uh, Matthias' wife is a uh, quite a huge uh, Twitter persona. So. Matthias is the, uh, you know, um, the one behind the curtains in the yeah. relationship. <laughs> She's on I was, was going to say I'm the dinosaur. I'm the dinosaur. <laughs> I cannot handle these social media tools. Right. Yeah. Unfortunately, at some point, if you have a business, at least you have to have someone in your business who knows. Because if you don't, yeah, no, I, I do see that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's, a, yeah, that's, that's what we have to solve. Yeah, and about setting a company, it's also something that. You know, maybe uh, actually it changed a lot to me that I had to do with some blockchain people because, you know, what I what I was being taught at these entrepreneurship classes at the university, they were always telling us, you know, like to do to do a company, you have to do the market research and and like do it systematically and then uh, take some courses at the university and then come up with an idea and come up with the team and make sure that this team is really synergistic and then work together on the business plan and then cooperate with some accelerator and then go out to investors and then uh, you know go for uh, go for some um, in uh, s some competitions for startups so that you get some voucher and get some initial cash and do this do that you know set a set a website create your presence blah 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 then you can develop a product actually you know and at some point you can just register a company finally and uh, but like block in blockchain, it doesn't work like this. In blockchain, if you want to have a company, then you basically open Google Maps and look for the nearest uh, chamber of commerce and just uh, look at the geodesic <laughs> geodesic path to the nearest chamber of commerce so that you can get there as soon as you can and you start a company. That's how it works. So actually, um, last year I've been to um, I've been to uh, Rome to to the like big conference in uh, human neuroimaging that is like our biggest conference in the field and and i was giving some workshop about uh, post uh, phd career tracks and this workshop was really packed like people sitting on the floor people standing outside like didn't even see me but speaking but they really wanted to listen and i was like there is a market for this i mean if if, if so many people are willing to stand outside the room uh, to listen then this is a big problem that should be solved and then I, when I came back, I just went to the Chamber of Commerce and registered the company. I, did, I didn't even know how my stream of income would ever look like nothing, but I just did it like the blockchain way. <laughs> and now I'm, I, I mean, I, I never regretted that, of course, but it, it was a long process from the day I formally started the company to, to the day I got any first income. And that was a long, long way. So it's, uh, it's not easy. Yeah. But um, okay, so uh, let's guys. If you have any questions, you can ask in the in the chat. We are waiting for your questions. Okay, uh, so now let's talk. Uh, let's uh, let's come back a little bit to your PhD, mm -hmm. uh, the times of your PhD. So since you are a truth truth teller and yeah. very open person, then I can actually um, um, like uh, make some use of this luxury today that and ask you the difficult questions, which normally people don't answer. <laughs> Okay. So uh, let me ask you, 
a very like tough question now. Do you actually do you have any regrets that you ever took a PhD? Oh yeah, of course. I think uh, on balance, I don't think it's worth it to do a PhD. That's uh, I, I think no. So let me be clear about that. So because there there are for me, uh, this is a very controversial controversial standpoint. But I think education is very important. <laughs> so I do think it has improved me as a person and uh, as a deepened my knowledge as a human being. I think that's that's good. If you if you're looking at a PhD as a way to make yourself more desirable in the job market, you are going down the wrong path. That it that doesn't happen. So it's like there are of course there are people who do very well after a PhD, but most people don't. So in my in my estimation. So it's it's just they could have easily just done a master's and then gone to the industry. It's fine, but I do I do find that the, the people who have done a PhD are normally more stimulating people than people who have not. So I think it's just a matter of education. I think I, I think it doesn't. To me, it's just like being educated, <laughs> and it doesn't really matter what it is. I mean, if if you if you know if you know history, if you know like some languages, if you, do, you know you know it makes you a more interesting person. And I think. It's, it also makes your life more interesting to know more things. So, uh, but that does not translate into more income. Right. I mean, like, I don't know if that has more to do with the actual knowledge or it has more to do with the hardship because, you know, I feel like we are like uh, rats in the desert. We would be the last ones to survive just because we had to survive in grad school for so many years. And like, yeah, it's, uh, but, it, but it, it's made more difficult than it has to be. Because there are there are quite a lot of people in academia who are should not be there, and who are actually professors, who make your life miserable. True. So it's like, uh, but I mean, it's like uh, the shit rises to the top, you know. That's uh, it's like that everywhere, right? So, and we have to suffer for it. So right. it's uh, yeah, sad. Yeah, actually, um, yeah, that, about that, I don't know. I think to be a professor, you still have to have at least a few skills that are desirable actually but uh, <laughs> well, uh, it's, it's for sure true for somebody yes yes but uh, i i know so many counter examples <laughs> <laughs> yeah maybe maybe it depends on the area neuroscience these days is so so uh so competitive that i don't see any professor that would be uh, not be at least uh, at least a middle class scientist actually to be really mediocre no, no, I'm not talking about the quality of science, just being an actual person that right. you can talk to. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, well, if we talk about psychopaths at workplace, yes. Uh, then uh, I wouldn't know about that. I wouldn't know about that. It's just uh, some people don't have any manners. <laughs> right. Yeah, okay. and I've come across quite a bit of them. So. Right. It's, uh, okay, so what was your original motivation? Why did you go for a PhD in the first place? Oh, yeah. Um, I think well, this is so long ago, of course. Um, I think I was very interested in research. So that, that that's, I mean, it's always, I think it's something that started when I was uh, just started in school. This was in the 90s uh, at the university. Uh, basically, like being frustrated by it, because I think the first thing, the first thing I ever studied was philosophy. I did theoretical philosophy. Uh, and then after that, uh, I was a bit disillusioned with that because, yeah. I mean, it's interesting, but it doesn't lead anywhere really. I mean, and it's it's not very stringent. And I I, I uh, sort of had the idea that okay, so maybe now I go to business school. So I went to business school, but then I really found that I was so frustrated that people who were talking about all these models that they apply, they have no math skills whatsoever. They don't know, they can't explain them. They they are just it made me angry. So I was like, no. So that was sort of the reaction I had to that then was that because I knew I knew my brother he he was studying math at the same uh, at that time uh, and I was like oh, yeah I'm gonna try that out because I'm just theoretical math and then I, I did well I did a master's in, in in theoretical math and I was like that sort of because I, that was all the trajectory I wanted I wanted to sort of learn more uh, understand the hard question like to be able to answer the hard questions in in mathematics. Uh, to be able to read something which is hard to, I mean, it's like learning a language, like learning this language, uh, being able to see, see connections, doing mathematical modeling. So it's like, that, that's what drove me down that 
uh, that path. But I think getting a PhD is not easy most of the time. It's it, it's quite competitive. So it's I didn't think I'd get it. So I did get it. Then I had a really terrible supervisor, and I had like a mostly a really terrible time during my PhD. So it's uh, and I ended up switching, but it didn't improve that much. But then I, I did meet. I have lifelong friends from that period, so it's uh, that I still hang out with and that live all over the world. So it's uh, there's always sides to anything, but I think well I. I I always say, people always ask me this question. It's a very common question. Did you would you recommend people doing a PhD? And I always say no, because I don't think it's a good idea. Yeah, actually, I also like recently wrote a post about uh, exactly that. So um, under what conditions it's good uh, to go for a PhD, and it's posted on my blog. I actually linked it here on the on the chat, and I totally agree. I think. The only uh, like reasonable situation in which you might consider a PhD is when you're really falling in love with your research topic and you really see yourself as a as a full time researcher in the distant future. And because uh, then it's the only option, you have to go through a PhD to be a professional scientist. That's what you and be you know do active research as an independent. Yeah, researcher. yes, because you have to have that drive. I think to because it comes at such a huge cost most of the time. So it's. Yeah, that's uh, and I, I'm sad about that. That's the truth because I don't feel like it should have to be that. I think it's there are so many people working against uh, a PhD students, whether they do it uh, consciously or not. I think it's basically the system is like that. That it's it it makes it very hard to to be a PhD student. Yeah, uh, most no, of the time. because I mean it's like very individualistic system. So you uh, on on paper. You work in a team, but in fact, everyone has their own agenda and their own uh, contradictory goals. And the, yes. the, it's like a game to play. And the rules of the game is that you have uh, you have to keep as many projects going on as possible and make sure that your name is high on the author's list and juggle as many projects as possible so that in the end you get you score the highest in terms of the publication record. So it's like really doesn't incentivize like actual work rather like games and and politics so it's like really um yeah and it doesn't get better as you move along in your academic career either no. so it's uh, it's the same <laughs> or worse yeah, that's so it's uh, yeah and that's also what i realized actually at some point i realized that this is a publication game and um i don't want to play games um if i if i was about to play games why not play money game <laughs> that's a that's a funnier game to play you know if i would like to spend my life on games why don't to play why not play poker right it's um it's uh, it's like the um, you know possible outcomes are much more pleasant than uh than yeah anything, you know. No, I think I think for me i mean i'm, I'm so grateful to the to have the knowledge that i have through this education but it has come at a very high cost, so it's to to myself. And I, yeah, totally. And I also think, you know, um, as Steve Jobs once said, you you can't really evaluate uh, what was worth it and what wasn't because you will connect the dots if in a in a distant future. So it's hard to predict. And oh, totally. Yeah. No. No. I, I, I agreed. Agreed. Uh, uh, it's it's this is only talked about. We only talk about this now in the context of somebody asking, should they do a PhD? And I think it's. Uh, Ultimately, it's hard. I mean, you can only say what what your experience is, and then people can take that for what it is. I think that's all we can do. So it's and but also to be aware that everybody's experience is, is unique. So there there are so many things that 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 can work for you and against you. So it's uh, and those are quite hard to say. I mean, they vary from institute to institute. I mean, I can really talk about only the places I've been. So it's at a certain point in time. <laughs> to be clear, so it's every 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 place changes, you know. So it's it's hard to say. Right. Okay. Well, uh, I think your your uh, point of view is very clear. Yeah, I wouldn't. Yeah, I'm actually um, a bit less uh, more tuned on this because, uh, yeah, I, I I really can't can't see. Uh, yeah, I will have to just come back to the question whether or not I regret my PhD in like twenty years time. It's a bit early now, I think. Yeah, so it's also because you just uh, yeah. It's also, it also doesn't matter that much what you do, but more like what you do with the what happens, uh, uh, what happens to you. So, like in my case, actually, I, I I did all the best things I could do with my experience. So I had some hardships, especially after my contract expired. But 
I kind of uh, started thinking about the solutions and created the company around it and I wrote a book about it. So I, I kind of, this was my response to the problem. So I kind of produced, produced. Uh, so in this sense, I cannot really regret doing a PhD because I built something on it, but, uh, but yeah. So again, like there will be a lot of problems, um, you know, like throughout life, but maybe it doesn't matter that much uh, as long as you actually can do something constructive uh, about it. Yeah, although I have to say also that it's not possible that every PhD student does exactly the same, right? So, the, you know, it's uh, you know it's also that um, this was my reaction to the situation, but it would also not be optimal if everyone has exactly the same, you know, uh, solution. So, yeah, it's, uh, there is no no space. I mean, there are, yeah, I mean, every everyone would have some like um, personal uh, follow up story after a PhD. I had my my own story, and like uh, it's actually good that people go in the different directions because uh, because otherwise, yeah, there will be yeah our our lives will be even harder after a PhD if we had all the same ideas to what to do with. Uh, our yeah, lives. and I, and I mean we also have to remember, of course, that there are people who, for example, like, like my wife who did her PhD and was very very happy through all of it, like uh, that was happy with the supervision and everything. I mean, it's. The, the, it's so I don't want to be like a downer. <laughs> with this yeah. thing. It, I guess the the only thing that, that that's important is to is to be careful. I mean, uh, for example, like what you just mentioned, what can happen after your contract ends? Like most most PhD students are not aware of that your money can actually run out. So mm -hmm. that that's happened to a lot of people I know, and they have to handle it in various ways. So it's 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 something that nobody talked to me about. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so yeah. it's, I think I think there there are things that we can make people aware of, which it's not talked about. I think that that's a good thing, and then people can take that information and do it with it what they want. But I think it's still I would have liked to be aware of it. So. Right? Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, no one told me about financial cushion, like completely zero, uh, zero yeah. information, zero uh, like awareness. Right? So. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a it's a material for another conversation. But <laughs> indeed, I indeed. totally agree. Um, okay, so I have like uh, my next question will be about your general advice. So, like looking back, uh, both at your PhD but also your post PhD experience, do you have any like specific advice that you would like to give to uh, early career researchers today? <sighs> yeah, so I think I think it's it's I guess kind of like maybe not so imaginative, but I think it's um, t take projects that that interest you, <laughs> and I think also like uh, I think what what is I think should be made more aware to people as they start a PhD. I think it's being done to some extent, but just to be aware of the amount of time you will have to start, you will have to look for funding when once you finish. So getting a postdoc is not so uh, it's not so hard. Uh, normally it's pretty easy because, yeah, people there's always a lot of postdocs and they're quite they're, they can be very from a year to two years. But just as you proceed after that, uh, it's a, I, I did a lot of applying for money, but it never really worked out. But I think it would have been much better to to be aware of that as as an actual thing, you know, and that you this is something that will be your life after you do this. It's only money. It's only getting funding. Um, that's how the system is structured. So it's like uh, those people who get the money and those people who have the contacts that are put on because people get put on applications without doing much, you know, just because they have the right contacts. Those are the people who proceed in the end. So it's 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 a lot about social networking and and uh, and just knowing about how to how to write a, a funding application. Uh, things you might not necessarily think about as a, as a PhD student because you're really focused on your thesis and, and, and stuff like that. So it, I, I know it can seem daunting, but I mean, there are courses in this so that are offered. I think that they can be quite not very great maybe sometimes, but I mean, I think I think you can at least get some insight into the sort of the how much work goes into this. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think that that's my advice, but I think most people will go for the things they're interested in. And I think that's great. So like, you're not going to do a postdoc that you're thinking like, what is this? <laughs> I have no interest in it. Of course, you're not going to do that. But you're going to have to realize that that postdoc will run out and you will have to, if you want to continue in academia, you need to be very much on your feet when it comes to funding. Right. Um, indeed, I agree. And I didn't really enter this game 
and I think um, yeah, that's also a different. Uh, yeah, that's also one of the things that were a bit repulsive for me in the system that you are after all uh, dependent on the opinion of one person because every time you apply for grant, there is some individual on the other side that you might not even know who is evaluating you and deciding about your uh, to be or not to be. And um, it's, yes. uh, it's always, I mean, you're always being assessed either by your clients if you have a company or by some external specialists if you are uh, yeah, a researcher applying for grants. But the point is, uh, if you are an um, entrepreneur and you work on the open market, then it's a statistic. So let's say you release a product to the market and a thousand people will see your website. Maybe 10 of them or 50 of them or 100 of them will decide to buy. Maybe the majority will skip it, but still you you uh, you have your income, you know, so it's, it's, it's just a matter of statistics. So if enough people or enough percentage of people believe that your product is exactly what they need and are willing to buy at the price that you gave, uh, then you're fine. It doesn't have to be any particular person, you know, it's just the statistics. And so yeah. if your product is good enough and if you make sure that it's visible enough, then you are fine. Like you don't have to be dependent on anyone, any particular opinion, like from any particular person. But yeah, in academia, you will always have, uh, even if you're a very famous and accomplished, there will always be, at every uh, big project that you are trying to pull off, there will always be someone, and often someone who you don't even know, who's anonymous on the other side, who is basically deciding about your future. So that's, uh, for me, that was a no-go as well. Yeah. Anyways, uh, okay. So, uh, guys, if you have any questions for Matthias, you have a last chance right now, because we are slowly coming to the end uh, of this uh, uh, interesting uh, episode. And so, you have a last chance now. And if, if I don't see any questions in the chat um, within the next few seconds, then I think we'll wrap up. Okay. Um, unless you, Matthias, you want to still say something that something juicy that. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I think I've done enough juicy stuff. So I've said enough juicy stuff in one session. Okay. Yeah, actually, this is also like important what you said because very important because it's actually a taboo to say that you regret your PhD. Like I think many people regret their PhD, but they just don't say it openly because they know that this is a taboo and that makes people feel bad. Uh, especially... I, I think I think I, I don't regret my PhD as such, but. Uh, but it's complicated, you know. So it's uh, like, and, and that's for me. It's 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 different from saying that. Uh, like, I would certainly say to people that be very careful when you if you do a PhD. Uh, but th this is from my experience, and and I think um, it's very complicated because I mean I, I really love the knowledge I acquired through it, but it's also like I, I also became quite ill, literally, mm -hmm. from doing it. So it's. I was I was very I, I lost so much weight and it's like I was very depressed and uh, yeah so so it was it's very complicated so it's it's not like it's a sunny story but I mean also to be aware that those sunny stories exist also so it's <laughs> they're out there so it's uh, yeah it's just to me I just want somebody to think about what they're doing and basically not and also maybe ask people around you know like if they know something about. But in the end, I mean, so there was a lot of people telling me not to do it when I was starting, and I didn't believe them. So, <laughs> what are you gonna do? It's, it's like, and I was young, much younger, also than them. So it's, uh, yeah, it's it's hard to. It's. I wish I could go back and talk to myself, but I mean, it doesn't work like that. So it's, uh, and then I mean, I'm happy I got through it, but it's it was it was very expensive for me. Personally, to do it, so right. that, that's 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 why it, it, this this issue is very complicated for me. Yeah, it's complicated tell. also because you always have to take into account the alternative. So if you didn't do a PhD, uh, you you wouldn't have a title of a PhD, but uh, you would have a few years of uh, youth to spend on something else. And indeed, yes, I, I totally agree. Yes, and also I can also tell you know the mental burden in academia is very high. Like I sometimes. Uh, I sometimes uh, had this feeling that 80% of all the effort I put, put into the PhDs into games and this like mental burden and I felt this even this um, capabolic effects of stress that I'm indeed burning calories just because of the frustration yes. and maybe 20% was burning calories on the actual work. 
So <laughs> if I if I if I if I didn't have that mental burden, like if I did some other job in some other area, I would have five times more done at the same uh, energy cost, you know. Indeed, yeah, no, it's, this is this is true. I agree. Um, okay. Okay, so I think we don't have questions for now. So uh, I would like to cordially thank Matthias for uh, these very interesting insights and for being uh, so truth telling today. I'm very happy that we have uh, yeah, one honest episode here about what can go wrong with a PhD and uh, and the career ahead. But I, I hope to see a good ending to the story. So I, I will yeah, be your <laughs> LinkedIn. And let's see uh, where uh, you end up, and hope sure. really good, uh, really good place, just as you deserve. And um, yeah, good luck. And uh, I would like to hear the yeah the follow up uh, later. Uh, sure, let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you guys, and have a nice evening. Bye bye.